Hey, welcome back to Interconnects. Uh, this episode is an exciting one. It's with Tim Detmers. Tim recently finished his PhD at the University of Washington. Now he's working at AI2, where I also work. And in the next year, he's going to start as a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Tim is known for a ton of impactful contributions to the open community, uh, whether it's QLora, other quantization uh, inference engines, plenty of other NLP research, and obviously the very popular quantization package Bits and Bytes, which is used extensively in the open ecosystem. I'm really excited for this one. We cover basic things like why open source may win out against closed models, how we should think about agents, kind of where scaling is going and where the future of AI is going, and just a great tour from low-level details of open source all the way to forecasting the next five to 10 years. So enjoy this conversation with Tim. Okay, Tim, welcome to our bootleg in-person AI2 office recording studio we might get barged into, but I'm just excited to pick your brain. I mean, we eat lunch together and we talk and it's obvious that we agree on a lot of things, but you have really unique perspective on a lot of things and it challenges normal worldview. So it's good to just share it with people. Um, I've got this rundown and we'll definitely go off script, but mm -hmm. it's mostly on things that I find your takes fun on to prompt you. Yeah. And it's like kind of looking at, we have the full Llama 3 suite from 1B to 405B. When they release them, it's like Mark Zuckerberg's like, oh, we're challenging the best models and we're making open source AGI and all this debatable stuff. But like, which of these models in the future do you think would be most useful or do they even need to go smaller? Yeah. Um, yeah. Th th first of all, thanks for having me here. Um... So I think, I mean, if I look at the Chinese models, actually, they're like super competitive and super good. Um, um, I mean, what I heard, and I think they also publicly said that there will probably not be an open source Llama 4. So... Um, what do you mean not at all? I don't think so. Um, I think the next sort of scale of models, they, they just will not be open source, I think. We had the end of open source models now. That do you, do you think they're going to release? Like they're still going to release like Llama four eight B and stuff like this. Do you think? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe, yeah. I th I think w w when I say sort of, um, they they're not going to release that, or we have the sort of the end of open source is like we probably will not get models that are much much more capable. We will not get uh, GPT five level open source models. This is like, like I'm trying to. It's funny because Wednesday is also my birthday and it's my one year anniversary at AI2. So I'm working, this might get released later, but I'm working on a post which is like, why open? Yeah. And then this is what it feels like the whole open source economy, the definitions are moving so fast. And yeah. it's like mostly influenced by Meta that is doing this thing for competitive reasons, which is yeah. totally the opposite of what we mean. We're like, why we are doing what we're doing. And it's like, that might be, in some ways, if Meta stops releasing them, good for the development of this area as a whole. But it also, but like all the hit pieces are like <laughs> open source AI is doomed. So I don't like. Um, yeah, I mean, on the other hand, I feel like we don't need much better models. Um, I think we're good to go. We just need to work with them better. Yeah, I mean, this is my. So it's like preference data has been the thing in post training that we do none of. And it's all the. Most of the open instruction data is like role playing and like these kind of yeah. not very specialized tasks. And yeah. we see like Alpaca Val and all these things are yeah. popular where we need a lot more kind of specifics on like what should people actually be doing with the open models. Yeah. Like, um, we can go right into this because I know you've been working on Sweebench a lot. And mm -hmm. like, do you think this is just one example domain, but like, in the future, do you think it'll be better to use OpenAI API models or those types of things? Or are people going to actually be training models on open ways to do this type of thing? I think, um, I mean, it's, it's had to have sort of several dimension this questions. I believe open source can be competitive and might be actually just overtake the closed source APIs uh, because of flexibility, because of ecosystem. Um, um, the OpenAI API is very specific. It's very done done very well for what you need it to do. Uh, but once you need to package it together, um, that's sort of where things end. And with packaging together, it's like build more complicated pipelines, incorporate fine tuning, and uh, incorporate steps where you make small adjustments to the model. Isn't this what a lot of AI products are doing? Like, isn't this what Perplexity is doing? 
like I've talked to them a bit. It, and yeah. I know other other startups yeah. that are yeah. smaller, but it's like they do multiple model passes, and then they just like put them all together. And there's probably like one core. There's the knowledge store, but the core model. I'm guessing it's some API model, and it's like, is that just because it's cheap? It's like why? It was a later question. It's like why do people build on APIs and not open models? Yeah. My consensus is yeah. it's so cheap and it's so easy right now, and you yeah. don't need the marginal gains. Yeah. Like, is that going to change? So yeah, I mean. I think right now we don't have the open source infrastructure to really compete in terms of cost effectiveness. Um, I mean, I, I developed some things um, and, and that that seems to work work quite well. And so um, I think um, if you look at the overall ecosystem and just inference, I think you can be competitive, but we need to create the open source infrastructure. Uh, but once we have that, I feel like fine tuning is too cumbersome. Open source will clearly win there. Um, Wait, and, let's be more specific. Look, yeah. What about using a fine tuning API is cumbersome? So, I mean, there are like privacy issues with uploading your data and so forth. Um, but then it's also, it's sort of a black box. Um, if you do a little bit of fine tuning, you quickly learn to how to do it. Yeah, and, and it's like the opening APIs are like LoRa's, right? Normally, um, I think it seems like that from what they're yeah, marketing it as. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, I think that, that that's sort of definitely a thing. Um, but yeah, it's also if you have your process, you get used to it and you know like how certain things look like if they're not working or if they're working, you can build on top of that. And you can take this experience, share it with others. With these sort of black box APIs, you don't know what's under the hood. You don't know if the system is changing. And this is kind of like a philosophical question that I'm thinking about with our work. It's like, will the APIs always need to do this like long tail of random implementation things? Because if fine tuning is so much more than instruction tuning now, like, yeah. is it almost? Do you think that'll be a reason that they lose if we get really good like preference tuning and RL infrastructure in the open? It's like, how is OpenAI going to like RL on your really specific prompts that you come up with for your business? Like, it. Yeah, I I'm I I don't know I I don't I think. I think OpenAI also has the philosophy to have the business stuff, let the businesses do that. Um, and I think integrating those insights into their API is just a hopeless hopeless problem. I don't think they have the expertise. I don't think it would make sense for them from a cost perspective to really figure out what is needed by everyone, how can we satisfy any, everyone. Um, but if you have an open source solution, open source can develop all kinds of solutions. Then you say like, oh, I, I take this, this is best for me. And then, oh, I take this, this Do you see that me. happening? Because that's like a big part of the Hugging Face model is like you'll yeah. have a model for specific yeah. things. And I follow Hugging Face and I see, yeah. it's mostly, I see like mostly multilingual as the area where there's really yeah. specific things. But how do we shift that into like, this is the, I don't know, arithmetic is a terrible example, but yeah. like that type of thing. Yeah. I mean, if, if when I talk to companies, a lot of companies use Qlora because it's cost efficient, but then also they just want to pull some data from the data store, fine tune it quickly, and then deploy the model and let's compare it and do an A-B test or whatnot. And um, so it's, it's like just that. this flexibility in the sort of, you have Lego blocks that you combine, but then also the infrastructure that works with their infrastructure that they have. I mean, in the end, you need to deploy it, you need to maintain it. and. Um, do you think the open source equivalent for Apple intelligence will end up being better because they can interface with more models? So like Apple intelligence is just Apple models yeah. and yeah. they'll have to do work yeah. to bring in the open source, yeah. but the open source won't help them. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I think uh, uh, actually the biggest sort of factor why I think Apple intelligence will not be the biggest thing is because it will be built for Apple products. Um, like I'm using it and it's entertaining. It's in beta and it's like, oh, this yeah. notification summary is entertaining. Yeah. It can generate tables, yeah. but like their iteration speed just seems like it's going to be so slow. Yeah, and it will be for their products. Like I think we are still at a point where it's unclear what people want to use AI systems for. Um, there are a lot of prototyping, a lot of demos, but not so many points that like, yeah, we really increase productivity. Um, often it's more engineered solutions that increase productivity. Um, but do you think Sweetbench is a good example? So um, yeah, I think so. I think um, so. So I okay. think a big problem with benchmarks is they're so saturated that it's unclear if an improved performance on MMLU or whatnot 
translate to real world performance. And the nice thing about Speedbench is like you know if you improve on it, it has real uh, sort of implications in the real world. Like if you improve a couple percent, that's what does a couple percent actually mean? So a couple percent is like a couple more. Um, working test cases on a GitHub issue, that's what it means, right? Yeah, it, yeah. Is there a fine-grained way to think about Speedbench? Yeah, so you, so you can think about sort of general difficulty and some bug fixes are just super hard on Speedbench. Okay. And um, then there's just a collection of sort of easy things. And sort of depending on that, you can quickly hill climb and then you sit hit certain yeah, certain... It's like, is that like almost levels? It's like you do all the easy ones <laughs> and you do the medium yeah. ones. I think Right now, it's still unclear, but that's what it feels like to me. Um, what do you think these companies that are raising tons of money to Max or Max on Sweetbench are doing? Yeah. Um, so, from from what I see from my work, is that the most important thing on, on Sweetbench is to get the workflow right. How you basically use your model, and that's so different than modeling. Like everyone thinks, like everyone thinks okay. about AI benchmarks as like yeah. the modeling problem, but that's why it's like we need. I think this will be a big focus yeah. in 2025, yeah. and I want to learn about it. And it's like, what does it mean for an evaluation to not be about modeling? Uh, that's right. That's right. Um, I think I think it will be difficult to disentangle uh, in the future. It's like our tasks get more complicated because they're too saturated. So we need complicated tasks. But complicated tasks, you can just like take a complicated task, throw it at a model. That will not be possible. Like you need to design things around it. But then the entire system. Needs to it be almost evaluated. seems like only base model evaluation is easy. Because we're having yeah. discussions for, for like reward bench v2, and yeah. there's a lot of new work on evaluating reward models. And we see a trend where like what we did was accuracy. So yeah. like, does your reward model agree with these pairs? Yeah. And then a lot of people are doing correlations with like downstream ROHF, which is like I think you need both. Yeah. But it's a very messy argument to be like you need something that correlates with something like Chatbot Arena, but there's so many steps in that chain you have to train your reward model, you have to have your evaluation data, you have to evaluate on humans. And the other yeah. thing is like accuracy yeah. and it's kind of constrained. And I think in Sweebench's case, to make it very academic, you'd probably need to have multiple facets. Yeah. Which is like, how does it handle this type of information? Yeah. How And then you will see the final score yeah. of like putting it all together. Yeah. So yeah, I, th I think evaluation is just a super hard problem. Um, uh, I think for me, um, so, so, so personally, I use Claude quite a bit. And if I look at the benchmarks numbers, GPT-4.0 looks quite good. But when I use it, it's like, no, Claude is just much better. And um, what is most of the code you're writing? Like, I know some of the tools you're writing. It's just like normal PyTorch or wrappers of yeah, things. Yeah, and, yeah. I actually don't use, um, I found AI models pretty useless for code. So I'm, I'm not using them much for code. But for, for so many what are you using it for? Then? I'm mostly writing stuff, thinking about stuff. Um, Sort of double yeah. checking my my thoughts, um, finding critical feedback, um, yeah, and a so lot you, of chores. you and Dirk are the people that are like it's not good enough for code. <laughs> it's the people that can just get so much done, and you've spent time doing enough code where it just not it's not going to help. It's not going to help with CUDA kernels. It's like you've no, gone so deep no. on different coding that you just don't yeah. need it. I mean, sometimes if you need to write a lot of boilerplate, it can be useful. Um, and also to sort of, I don't know, one time I, th I thought like, hey, this problem must be possible with with like these models. And I, I actually tried both Claude and GPT-4.0 and it's like, it's, it's just the code appears to be good and it's sort of sensible. But then if you look at the details, it makes absolutely no sense. And it's sort of, it's just more work to disentangle the code into something that's good that you can build on. So. I don't know. My thinking is like, if, if the code doesn't require much expertise and you have an existing system that you extend, good. If you want to have sort of core system that you build on, not good enough. If you have requires deep expertise, also not good yeah, enough. Yeah, it's like you could write, no offense to the hugging phase transformers ecosystem. Like you could probably write another model pretty easily. Yeah. And it's like an add on. Yeah. But writing the core abstraction for like a training architecture is yeah. really hard. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, Models can write it, but then you will lose so much time in the future when you need to get back to change something, maintain it, or yeah. the maintenance uh, thing. Just is choices very are really bad. The design. I mean, choices. like I've definitely seen code that I've written that I am blown away that Claude solves it, but then later I'm like, well, that was a minor issue. It's like the random doubling batch size or something that I didn't know was in it. So it's 
it's a net ad for me and I still use it. I mean, I know I'm not like I'm not as good of an engineer as a lot of people I work with. So I'm like, I'm happy to have something that normalizes yeah. the distribution. So like what is happening is probably like the best coders are still better. And then the people that weren't as good are getting pulled up. So yeah. like the Delta isn't as yeah. big, but you, you still have probably a headway, but like I can just do a lot of stuff that I couldn't do. So, so I see it myself when I write in languages that I don't really know, or I don't know, it just, I, I understand quickly things, I make quick progress. And probably there are all the underlying issues that I um, just said, but I don't rec I don't see them because I'm unfamiliar with the issues in those language or yeah. with a particular sort of piece of software. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, switching gears, you're from one hat as an engineer to your hat as an academic. It's yeah. like um, it's easy as well resourced academics to choose the right problems to work on. But what should people with various amounts of compute be doing to try to contribute either to this open ecosystem and write good code or just like fundamental research and language yeah. models? Like, yeah. do you have a, yeah. a few things you recommend? Yeah, I think it's it's a lot about trends. So, and, and, and I view it often from sort of, um, there are, if you want to get good AI systems, there are tiny, a lot of tiny factors, sort of multipliers. And you can sort of, if you have a low multiplier, it's very much worth to sort of scale it up and just improve the overall product of all these small factors. And if Wait, I look what at- What do you mean by multiplier? So do you so mean like multiple models in the so system or what? You can figure out a better architecture or better attention or yeah. better right. scaling. So it's like what people at big companies call like flop efficiency or, or something. Or, or quantization, but they're, yeah, yeah. They're, they're diminishing returns. And at some point it's like, yeah, if you improve it a little bit more, it's, it's not making a difference. And so you should look for what is making a difference and I mean, it gets harder if you don't have the compute resources, but I think that's sort of the first factor. Um, I see a lot of people, when they get compute resources, they're like, ooh, I got all these GPUs, and then they work on problems that require a lot of what, GPUs. Let's put some numbers on it. As academics, like, um, a fun thing is like, how many GPUs does UW have? We can, sh like, we AI2 is known, we have this like 1000H100 cluster that's growing a bit, yeah. and a long tail of other GPUs and yeah. some TPU access. Yeah. Like, that's more than most academics. And then how many does like something like UW have? I mean, UW has around uh, 600 GPUs. Um, Probably for more people is what I'm guessing. Uh, if it's actually like less, it depends. Okay. And so um, um, I actually sort of helped sort of design the cl cluster and has a sort of the system where um, sort of PIs buy GPUs and then their students can use those GPUs, but then there's a free queue where everybody can get idle GPUs. And so I, as a student- It's a great system, where it's yes. like the rich rich professors help pull up everyone else. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, I, I always use the idle queue and I could get like 100, 200 GPUs, no problem, most of the time. And so I could do- How do, do you feel like this compares at other well-off, like CMU, Berkeley, Stanford, yeah. MIT, yeah. like do they have yeah. similar access? Yeah. I th I thought so, uh, uh, but when I was on the job market, I could see that very few institutions actually have good GPU systems. This is something that's like with the poli talking to the policy of the government. It's like if you can assume the government can spend one to three billion dollars on yeah. AI, it's yeah. like a lot of people are like, let's just buy a lot of GPUs. But it's almost like it's you're just going to get caught in the fact that you buy GPUs that you can't utilize if you just spend the money on it. So it seems like UW did well. And I'm guessing other yeah. institutions have GPUs that it, like can't quite work for the whole community as well. Yeah, and I mean, there are multiple, uh, one, one issue that I often hear academics are like, oh, we have money, let's buy GPUs. And then they buy the GPUs and then figure out, oh, my storage is too slow and I can't use the GPUs because my storage is not working well. Or, oh, my networking is not working well. Or, hey, my queuing system is so Do you poorly think designed. The AI2 Beaker team should be more open about the things we're solving and how we make those decisions? Like, would that help academics? Um, I think I think the software is not necessarily the problem. Like you can use Slurm, but it's like how we're deciding with vendors, even because yeah. AI2's oh, GPUs aren't just from like we, there's a decision yeah. process between yeah. all these big clouds, yeah. medium clouds. Yeah, I mean it's complicated. Um, it's it's like sort a... of so. So I mean, what I can say there, are certain cloud provider set are known for having reliable networking. They have the NVIDIA stack, which is much easier to integrate in software. It's just tough that it's often it's like an IT department that's going to make these decisions. Um, I don't yeah, know. I don't yeah. know. I'm just trying to learn about like the academic sphere yeah. and what we could say to people that are like, I have X amount of GPUs. Yeah. 
And I generally think that it's like the amount of GPUs that you need multiplied, like if you multiply a training run, the amount of GPUs mm -hmm. you need to do a training run in an amount of time that gives you feedback faster. So normally yeah. like for non-pre-training things, it's like you want your experiment to be like order of an hour is like you can do it really fast. Yeah. Order of day or two yeah. is like it's still good. And then yeah. like once you go beyond a week, it's yeah. like hard to mentally string them together. Oh, yeah. So it's like, I'm guessing there's a lot of people that can do these experiments, but they do them sequentially because they don't have enough GPUs. And it's like, how do you, like, what is the GPU, like, what is the trade-off that people yeah. can make to yeah. try to scope yeah. their problems? So, so uh, I mean, one thing how I approached my research in general was I get a baseline that is informative and runs in four GPU hours. And so if you have that, and and you you also need to check if it sort of extrapolates and most of the time it doesn't but it gives you a good correlation so you know if you're right then you know like maybe i could be right but if you're wrong you definitely know you're wrong and so you can get a quick result um and see if ideas make sense once you're on the setup you just you don't want to run an experiment and then experiment expect you run like a hundreds at a time yeah. then another hundred and another hundred you get evidence very quickly, and then you know, like, okay, this is this and this. And I've this definitely idea. heard this from professors, yeah. research managers, that the people who stand out are the ones that can mentally run the most experiments in parallel and keep track of them. I think I think that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> how, so, do curate, so, how do you select or curate for that skill? So, so, uh, oh, um, <laughs> like um, if you're gonna advise a student, it's like yeah. how do you get them to set up their life so that that is like a doable thing? Um, I mean, I I have done it and I feel like you need a certain mental model to get in sort of this mindset and really I mean basically what you just described that if you know that's a goal you can optimize for that but most people think like the goal is something different um, and then you're not optimizing for that so um, the, the thing is for example you can spend two weeks on infrastructure and then run a lot of experiments or you can say like no no I get my, need, my, need to my, get my experiments going and then quickly run an experiment another experiment another experiment for my experience it's always more efficient to first build the infrastructure and then just uh, gives you this sort of peace of mind you can think more clearly and then run things. what are other are there other popular frameworks you've released other than Qlora that are like infrastructure that are that I just don't know about I mean like bits and bytes I know about I associate that with Qlora yeah, but how much yeah. is it more than that uh yeah I mean there is some library that's is called sched it's like a GPU scheduler that I built over my PhD um, and people use weights and biases I think it really holds them back um, weights and bias is like why? really bad well, for. I mean, if if I run a thousand experiments, no no hope in to analyze it's hard weights and And so what I developed, so what this system is, it's sort of does a grid search in a way where you get the most information with the least experiments, and then it does an is analysis. Is it like a Bayesian optimization thing, or uh, is it just a it's a grid, no, grid search algorithm? It's, it's sort of a, a certain grid uh, search job which. Um, so, so what you can do is basically an interval search, so it's not random search. Yeah. And then what you can do is combine different hyperparameters in different settings. So um, um, in, in that way, um, you basically, if you want to evaluate multiple hyperparameters, then you have for each hyperparameter only one experiment, but you have for all different kinds of combinations with the particular hyperparameter, maybe a dozen experiments or more. And so that isolates as a variance. And so what you can do with my tool is basically give a group variance for that hyperparameter based on all other hyperparameters. That makes sense. And yeah, then yeah. you can see what matters. What is your background in? I should have asked earlier. Like before your PhD, what were yeah. you doing? Yeah. I, I worked a little bit in automation industry for three years, um, studied a little bit of psychology. Do you mean robotics or what type of automation? Uh, that was factory automation and mostly food factories, a lot of Is this milk like logistics? Factories. Um, like, what are you actually doing? Yeah. So, so, I mean, there are different parts of sort of uh, factory automation. Sort of what I specialize in sort of integrating systems, integrating their data systems, and then um, routing data, uh, making data accessible to sort of a person that controls all machines, or to management that sort of gets aggregated reports on performance. Uh, 
Yeah. I'm trying to understand why infrastructure might not be prioritized as much. Because it seems like when you have very good infrastructure, you can approach re- approach your AI research in a much more scientific way. Yeah. And is it just the same rat race incentives that are kind of making people not prioritize it? Um, this is a good question. I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't quite know myself. I think, I think, if I think about, I mean, so when I started in my PhD, and I think about software engineering, my software engineering, engineering skills went down because I was in this mindset of like just producing an experiment to get a result. And that's often the fastest way to move forward because you just need a negative result to reject an idea. So you quickly yeah. want to get that negative result. And so, um, with this mindset, you have sort of the mindset of the throwaway software. Uh, you just want to build the software and throw it away. It's like all of my, it's like all of my PhD was built on this, except for the one paper that was like a tool. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. well, like, why is yeah. this the? Yeah. It's like, why is this the case? And it's only like only at AI two that I yeah. feel like I've started. I mean, like at Hugging Face, I learned a lot more about open source software. Yeah which is very fun to like yeah. be on the ground floor of when like diffusers is happening. And yeah. it's like, you do these opinionated things to make your users' lives the easiest. Yeah. And then some of the things are about making your life easier, which is Hugging Face's audience is different than the researcher audience. Like the Hugging Face yeah. audience is, we have a ton of users. We need to make their lives easy yeah. for what their use case is. Yeah. And the researcher is, I have one to three users and I need to make this very good for a long time frame, yeah. which is like a very specific type of open source software. And it's yeah. like open instruct our fine tuning libraries like this, where it's, we didn't have it packaged like pip installable for yeah. like eight months yeah. because we use Docker. So it was easy to load the Docker image and then edit your files. But if you had pip install, it added a whole bunch of steps mm-hmm. on it. And it's like, this is like really yeah. nice tooling, yeah. but it's like the opposite from what TRL looks like yeah. at Hugging Face. And yeah. it's like having more examples for people to understand academic tooling seems yeah. cool. And now I'm wondering like, oh, what is, how does like open, is OpenAI's research tooling tied to their deployment tooling? Or is there a fence that it goes over? Um, I mean, as as far as, as I I heard, um, there's definitely quite some um, difference. There's also some overlap. I mean, if somebody builds efficient tooling, you can reuse it. But for certain problems, you need certain tooling. Uh, what uh, also an, 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 uh, a colleague um, said, uh, also working in a frontier lab, is that basically every experiment is an infrastructure problem um, if you work at a certain scale. And so... You just first need to engineer the infrastructure to run that experiment. And it, how you describe it sounds a little bit like um, um, sometimes the infrastructure is too specific to generalize. So you probably have your production uh, sort of infrastructure. You have like sort of experimentation infrastructure. And then you have sort of small sort of branches that branch off of it that you use for a small project or so. But you probably need to work on it a little, a little bit to get something started. Yeah, um, it's like is this is like a hard question. It's like if your only lab only has a few A one hundreds and H one hundreds, is the best bet to not do language models then and do something that's longer term? Um, so I think you can do really good research on very little compute um, in language models. I mean, you shouldn't pre-train language models. Yeah. Um, certain problems need a certain amount of compute. Um, I, what I see, for example, on Sweetbench, you need enough compute for inference, and um, that's significant. Um, but also, certain problems on Sweetbench, you can you do with less compute. And so, I think uh, constraints actually give you sort of more creativity. Um, and so, um, I was I was at Meta um, part time for like two years, and I had access. I could run. Things on like 500 GPUs. The amount of experiments I could run when I was a Facebook intern yeah. was absolutely hilarious. They had set up a whole new cluster, and then most of Fair like didn't know how to use it yet, probably because yeah. they didn't know how to use Slurm. Yeah. Yeah. And some software engineer was like, "Here, you can use it, and I can use like 300 concurrent GPUs yeah. in like 2019 as an yeah. intern." Yeah, <laughs> I was yeah. like, "What?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was just yeah. silly. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, for me it was I had access to all the GPUs, and I worked on problems that required a lot of compute, but I didn't make good progress, and then. At some point, uh, so this uh, steel with uh, this matter was for two years. And then I went back to the University of Washington, had much less compute, but I made much more progress because I know, like, oh, I can't work on these expensive problems. I really need to think about what problem I should work on. And 
what I can use with my resources. And that, I think that made, it made my research actually better. So are you still, I mean, your job talk, everyone hyped it up about your story about using laptops and everyone's compute. Like, do you think that's going to be the case in the next few years? Yeah, definitely. So, so, so the laptops I, over there, I would hold yeah. them up. The, like ridiculous <laughs> bricks that we all get. <laughs> um, no, I think our laptops will be uh, powerful enough to run I mean, not, probably not develop, but run uh, the AI that we probably want to use in everyday life. Um, yeah, and I mean, as I said, there's sort of this question, will open source and closed source, how they will compete? I think open source will win, actually, over time. OK, well, let's, let's dig into this. Like, There's two things. Like, Why will open source actually win? I think we've talked about scaling a bit here. I've kind of put my, like, I feel like I'm a scaling moderate where I'm like, yes, the loss will go down, but you're yeah. really putting yourself into financial, yeah. you're, you're making a financial bet, which is, yeah. which, okay, like OpenAI raises so much money, all these companies raise money, it gets funneled through TSMC, we get new process nodes, like, yeah. we're going to keep these process nodes forever, we're going to be able to make better computers, so it's nice in some ways that they're doing this, but the financial risk seems extreme. So that's my, yes. like, yes. Like, Yes. Are you a, a bubble buster? Like, do you think this is all gonna just blow up? I think a lot of AI startups will blow up. I'll say the like things that can be yeah. controversial yeah. first, and yeah. you can fill them in. Yeah. Like, so many startups are gonna go belly up because yeah. that'll hit them first, yeah. and Google's yeah. fine. Yeah. I mean, I th I think probably we follow a similar pattern to the dot com boom. So we will grow more, 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 probably a couple more years, and then ninety five percent of companies will fail. Uh, but then the remaining companies will probably. Yeah, I, I think AI will have a major impact. And so I don't think um, AI will not work, but it's I don't think we have what we need right now. If you look at OpenAI, they did cool things, but they really failed at landing a product besides ChatGPT. Well, yeah, and, you know, ChatGPT is a huge land, but it's like <laughs> an unintentional land. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. And so I don't know, um, compared to the cost might still work out for them, but it's Do you still think set. AI is like the most transformative technology of our time? Or do you think that it's just like slightly additive to everything that was happening in the internet? Um, I think it will be quite transformative. It's unclear how exactly. I mean, people debate that still about the internet. Like if you look at social media and you say like, is that it? Um, if you look at the value created, like finding digital information ads. and sort of, um, I, th I think I think uh, digitalization uh, sort of, if you look sort of an economic scale, was just really important. Um, Part of my view is like, what would be the case if like, recommender systems were all built on open source infrastructure? And I yeah. think language models are more culturally salient because people talk to them in yeah. text. Yeah. Now people talk to them in voice. Yeah. And that almost just feels like a stronger imperative because all of the negative effects can go way deeper. It's almost like this, what is it, the stupid food chain thing where you have toxins and like the the little fish yeah. don't get that affected mm -hmm. by the toxins, but all the whales die. Yeah. And it's like, we're just getting the really, really concentrated technology, mm -hmm. which is like, that's why I don't want yeah. it to be screwed yeah. up. But yeah. do, you, like, do you think about these things? Um, I mean, I I wonder how what, in, in what way AI will sort of impact society. Um, I mean, if you look at social media, I think most people would say it hasn't been entirely positive, and so um, I think with AI is like the question: uh, where will there be sort of good parts and where will there be bad parts? I think overall we see good parts in terms of um, it's it's helpful. Uh, to some degree, um, it like gets developer pro developer productivity and information economy productivity yeah. is already way higher, which is like obviously and it's it's our most val it's yeah. the economy that drives the most value in the world. It's just so boring if all that happens is fa Google, Apple, Meta get three times as big, and that's the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at the global economy, that's that's still not not that major. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, if you look in the US, um, yes. Um, I mean, there's some, I was quite skeptical about economic growth through AI. If you look at the global data, it doesn't show, but um, we see the first time since a long time, actually a nonlinear increase in uh, productivity growth. And Oh, really? Is this recent yeah. or from what? No, pretty so, recent, like okay. since, since uh, the last two quarters, I think. And it's like, oh, this, this hasn't happened since, since a sort of um, 
internet revolution and it's like and i expect this stuff to take like 10 years like this is the time scale that we need to look on because i think it's less i yeah. buy more this is probably similar i buy more into we need to figure out how to use this than yeah. scaling is yeah. going to solve all yeah. of our problems uh, but with computers it was the same i mean computers didn't make us more productive in the beginning and it took like 20 years and when so, do you document the start of computers? Uh, <laughs> like, when I mean, is the PC? <laughs> I, I think I think the start was like IBM and having computers and businesses. And so um, you could think, do things faster. That's why people bought these machines. But productivity growth, you didn't even see it with sort of early Windows where computers became more widespread. It only started um, later. And so, um, yeah. We already seen, or I mean, it's still unclear if the growth that we're seeing is due to AI. Uh, it's it seems that it could be, and part we, of it feels like a self fulfilling process where we have yeah, AI, yeah, but we also have be. like Waymo and we have SpaceX, or like Tesla. Yeah. Like these are not AI things, but it's all getting conglomed together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the question is like, what what do you call AI if you just say AI is just big models trained on lots of data that are very expensive? Um, like, I mean, Waymo is like a big AI system that's complicated. It also has expensive models. Have you ridden in Waymo? Uh, uh, no, I oh, actually yeah, yeah. I was in San Francisco. And I missed. I You've missed... got to do it the next time you're in town. <laughs> it's like immediately. It's like this is the future. It's like I will pay twenty percent. Honestly, I pay a bigger margin to Uber, and yeah. I'm like, it's just flat out way better. Yeah. And I was, was, I just encourage everyone to do it. It's like, yeah, it's. Yeah much more visceral than AI. Like AI has these aha moments and I was hoping that the AI talking to AI would feel more like this. Yeah. But talking to it, I'm kind of like, oh, that's, that's kind of not, that's not good, not good. Mm -hmm. It was like, I was hoping I'd be able to say something interesting yeah. about it, but yeah. it's like ChatGPT and just information processing yeah. is just so much more yeah. straightforward. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. What 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 what, uh, what, what a, a models are you usually using? GPT-4 Claude or? Yeah, it's mostly these. Yeah. I If I'm doing technical coding, it's Claude. Yeah. I, use ChatGPT for like information, changing a matrix from Markdown to LaTeX or yeah. grabbing it in and yeah. converting it yeah. and it's just a bit better. Yeah. I mean, like don't use O1 as all, which is my yeah. next thing is like, O1 is a perfect example of this product problem yeah. where from a technical perspective, yeah. I'm like, this is the most interesting thing to happen for the year. Like open O1 to me, like it's just so interesting that yeah. you can get this extremely different behavior from an obviously different yeah. model training stack, but yeah. it's like we don't know what to use it for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm I, 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 yeah. Oh, one, I'm, I'm not a believer. Um, <laughs> so many people work on reasoning. I think it's a really bad research direction. Um, um, I don't think reasoning is really important. Um, it like, okay, in humans, reasoning is one thing that set us also apart from other animals. But if you look at neuroscience and reasoning, uh, you would often sort of um, categorize as working memory. You store information, manipulate that information in your temporary storage, and then with that, you solve problems. And most of the problems you can't solve with working memory. Um, but it's also very weakly correlated with intelligence. Um, uh, you can take me as an example. I'm dyslexic. Dyslexics are known to having uh, extremely poor um, working memory capacity and function. Uh, I'm the bottom five percent in working memory for. Uh, what are the things that people symbols? use working memory for? I'm sorry. Like, let's get make it more concrete. So uh, basically, any conscious processing. Okay, so like holding numbers in your head, yeah. doing math. Okay, yeah. but also holding this conversation in your head. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, if you plan already the next question or where do you go with this conversation? It's all intuitive. I, like, I do way less prep than a lot of people do because I've, it's like part of the brand of being open yeah. is like yeah. I'm trying to yeah. just bring where I am yeah. and transparent yeah. and that's like I'm writing is not yeah. the end of it. It's just like, this is where we are at and I will try to make it as clear as possible and yeah. I want to, and it's like I want to bring people in and yeah. just kind of see how it goes. But otherwise, it's like it's yeah. almost so much work. <laughs> So, so it sounds like, yeah, there's so much work part that requires working memory. But uh, if it feels like sort of flowing and natural and you use your sort of intuition, no, no reasoning required. Yeah, That's it's like the working memory is the 30 page paper for 2 loot 3 that I need to <laughs> extract out of my brain and put into the tech. That's the working memory, which yeah, I definitely. Yeah. Use, but that's, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. So, so, um, so I mean, the models don't do this. Like, that's sort of like. Yeah. So, so if you look at O1, it does 
reasoning perfectly it, it it sort of reminds me of what i what i read in the psychology neuroscience literature it's just doing exactly this process that people would describe as reasoning but it's not working because reasoning is not that important and so i think people are like oh if we have reasoning we have human intelligence no, we don't other things are more important i'm just mostly interested in it because it's an interesting behavior like i have no idea yeah. what it would be used for um i've been recently thinking that O1 models are similar as a proof of point to like a text uh, an information store language model where you have a lot fewer parameters yeah. and you're just doing the processing yeah. on an information store. Yeah. I wish more people would talk about this because like O1 is O1 mini is very small yeah. and the model is doing the reasoning, yeah. but it's like they need to do that training thing on a giant information store and yeah. they have a perfectly up to date yeah. model with their That's training. It's like that almost seems like a better product than what they have served for O1. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I bet that would be also even more difficult than what they have now. But um, so if I think about the brain, um, it's actually, it has sort of a long-term memory component, a retrieval component, then a working memory component. If you look at the sort of neuroscience literature, they often like sort of combine uh, because that's what you need in order to reason. So working memory is the most important part, but you need to load stuff into working memory. And for that, you need to retrieve. And there's sort of a hierarchy that goes from short-term memory to sort of a sort of a hash table and then to a new cortex to then retrieve and basically loop it back into working memory. And that's just required. And there are two basically stores of working memory. One is sort of for execution memory. One is for symbolic memory and planning. And so you need to basically populate these stores in order to reason. But um, yeah, you need a retrieval model for that. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I don't even have a response, but I appreciate it. Like, this is why it's like products like Perplexity make sense because they they're I mean they are products. Yeah. And they have a long way to go as a business. Yeah. It mostly hinges on figuring out advertising, yeah. to be honest. Like a lot of these companies hinge on figuring out advertising for chat models. But it's like a nice analog to think about multiple language model passes, yeah. which is eventually where the industry, where academia will go. It's just a hard thing. It's like we're just figuring out language model evaluation. There's all these things. Yeah. And then we're going and then we're making it into this composite thing. Yeah. Which yeah. is hard. Yeah. No, I think it will be like composite systems, like complex systems. Unclear what form and shape they take. I think we have from that benchmarking is hugely important. We need to figure out what we measure. We need to figure out what people care about. Like uh, there's a reason why open AI well, cannot to, get a product that makes sense. Do academics need to work on problems that people actually care about? Or is it fine? Like, we can just make evals that show interesting behavior. Yeah, I mean, there's sort of the academic direction of working on problems to find knowledge and then spread the knowledge. But it's more satisfying to find knowledge that is helpful for people. And for things to be helpful, they need to be yeah. somewhat grounded <laughs> in something that matters to people, that is helpful to people. And for that, you need to understand what they need and um, if, if you understand the needs and wants then actually what systems would fulfill these needs and wants and then you have something that you can evaluate that has this sort of path from like I create knowledge which is useful and if you just create knowledge that might later be useful I mean there are a lot of examples in like math where we have mathematicians say like oh this will not be useful and then it's like super useful but I mean if we look for benefits in the near future AI is moving fast, then it needs to be grounded somewhat in what people care about. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I think a lot of like a lot of why I work here is just like I want to do basic things that people can build on. Yeah. It's like being in at the foundation level where you're building these models is something different and requires more re research and like resources is actually the word I meant to say. I kind of yeah. stumbled. Um, and then it could, going back to our academic conversation, it almost seems like a good thing to do is like to be imaginative on what you can use these for yeah and then build best cases build best practices yeah. recommendations examples yeah. and storytelling yeah. like and then you start to build evaluations yeah. and stuff like yeah. this yeah yeah i wish people would be a little bit more creative i mean it feels like uh, a lot of researchers sort of are sort of like engineers. They're like, oh, this is a problem. Like, you need I, to be... I can book you a calendar appointment or like <laughs> I can summarize your email. It's, it's not really problems. Uh, it's a, you need to be in a privileged position to where boring things are impactful, which is like AI too. We are the only people that can tell you everything and we have enough GPUs to do something. But like, unless you're on the same order of magnitude as somebody with the same thing, you have to be doing something different. 
Yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of room for different things. I don't know. I don't know what the problem is. I think it's, yeah, um, probably thinking like, oh, uh, well, it's some poor people in labs and they figured everything out. It's a, I don't easy, think it's a simple trade off. It's like things are hot now. Yeah. You want to make your, if, if you, it's hard to make your name when things are not hot. When things are hot, it is easier. It is like a, a presumption. So like what the thing to do is you try to latch onto something that is obviously yeah. going exponential. And therefore a lot of people try to do it where it's like, I understand it. It's yeah. just like taking risk and be, being like cognizant and understanding of like what the, what it will feel like to do something new is hard. It's yeah. like what, and I, like, I don't have a lot of advice for people. It's just like, that is what it will feel like. It yeah. will feel weird and yeah. you'll probably get like, oh, why are you doing yeah. that from a lot of people? Yeah, yeah. Now, I think I think that's the right perspective. Um, it's just, you need to go with things that are growing, but then we are off a little bit sort of left or right, but it's sort of uh, unclear when to do that, when is right and that sort of thing. I think it's a, also a bit thing like, um, I don't know, I, I, I see a lot of people following the frontier labs but when i hear from the frontier labs nobody has a clue what's going on uh, among them like they're just building stuff like we do they 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 have no clue they build one stone thing at a time and things break together and then they try again and um they have no good explanations for things um they're just more compute um they have good people um, yeah they have good Talent density and yep. compute density, which yep. are like there's so there's it's green fields when you have both of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I wanted to ask your opinion on some random technical things. What do you think of instruction tuning versus RLHF? Um, not not really an opinion on that. Um, I think we can we can go a long long way with synthetic data, and so. If I say how much human data, I think human data is very precious and we need it, but we probably can get away with less that is more targeted, more high quality. Yeah, it's very hard to measure this. I think yeah. the synthetic data is almost a more interesting point. I think it's like John Shulman said this, which is like, if thinking about preferences, it's like humans are high noise, low bias, and yeah. AI is high yeah. bias, low noise. That's, that's and we right. don't know what the bias and the noise are, yeah. but we know like synthetic data is the future in most things yeah but it's like we don't know these fundamental things right. which is like what actually are they and i'm just like well if someone could present me with a really compelling research paper there that will be like seminal work yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, i think that's that's exactly the problem um and i think you said right we basically have no clue to our project but it's not that we're building on quicksand like the synthetic data is not quicksand because it's a real thing but it's like if we can understand the core principles yeah. of it, then you can kind of use it more precisely yeah. and know when you need to have human yeah. verification. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think there are some clear patterns that you can use synthetic data to sort of quickly figure out if your model is wrong, but it's just very difficult to figure out if your model is right. And probably for that, you need human data. This is sort of my intuition. And a lot of, and a lot of, sort of problems we currently are not verifying if our models are wrong which we probably could probably do easily with synthetic data. people in post training are trying to do it more like a lot of the compute from rlhf using being more yeah. is by filtering and verification yeah yeah and a thing that we're starting to scratch with tulu 3 is, is like training on specific test cases for our model so essentially if you have prompts where you can verify yeah. the answer yeah. which almost seems like something that might it's like we're doing it for gen very general capabilities, yeah. like math, instruction following, the valves that everyone knows. But it's like, what if RL training on test cases becomes something that works for every type of example? And yeah. then it just is a matter of like, you need to have verifiable prompts, yeah. which is something that I could see RL being used for specialization for that because yeah. the reward signal is nice. Yeah. It's, it's just a little bit of supervision. It yeah. lets, it's essentially if the model can generate the answer but not reliably yeah. it will increase the re reliability yeah. of it if the model cannot generate it you can't train it with rl to just generate it it's just going to be gibberish yeah yeah that, that makes total sense to me i think yeah this overall direction makes a lot of sense you want to use synthetic data it's so early it's just yeah. early it's, the rl stuff compared to dpo is 
interesting because it's generating different types of synthetic data. Yeah. And in some ways, I feel like the DPO thing was a good distraction where it's like you need DPO to make it people make thousands of people realize they can do research on alignment. Uh But also because everyone is going to come in and do this easy thing, it therefore like it over indexes what the research community is doing on this thing that has a, a, that isn't the whole field. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the research community is sometimes a little bit slow to sort of um, change the direction, but I feel like with science in general, it can be slow, but it's pretty reliable over time. I think we figure things out. It's like a genetic process. It's like it's just kind of how it's like the I can't describe it as like the march of progress. It's like a thing that's just yep. there's a lot of noise and it's like a lot of the scooping these days. It's like this validating results. I think and almost any unless you're like extremely brilliant, almost any problem is going to be happening in some other lab at the same time because yeah. of the level of interest. Yeah, yeah which is so. why I recommend people to like invest in just being really good at getting your paper story and make it you, you have first impressions to your research it's like you have to capture the person that's thinking about looking at your work that's right that's which is right. not what we are often trained yeah okay from instructions also model merging uh-huh. i think people finally accept that it is a crucial thing like what is what was your first exposure to this i think i don't remember the title of the paper off the top of my head but like how did you become tuned into model merging? So, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, we, we had a paper branch train merge. And there, the key insight was that um, if you, you, so as you want to train experts in this case, and you want to train them on different data. And the key insight was like, if you train the experts on different data, then you try to merge them back together, sort of merge the expertise into one model, it doesn't really work. And the insight was that, okay, if you start out with just a single general sort of expert train on all of the data just for a little bit, then um, the optimization landscape settles down. Mathematically, it's sort of the spectrum of the Hessen um, uh, settles into a, a sort of subspace. And so most of the optimization happens only a sort of a tiny uh, subspace in, in sort of the overall parameter space of the model. And how you can visualize it is like the model first doesn't know what it's doing, and then it goes down the lost canyon. Yeah. And once it's there, it changes very little. And once it's there, then you might uh, so so once you train, and this only takes like five percent of the training time, or sometimes even less. And after that, you can take this general expert and train on all kinds of different specialized data sets. And so if you do that, then in the beginning, you go down the canyon. And once you're on the canyon and you specialize, you branch off a little bit in either direction if you train on different data sets, but you're still in the same local neighborhood. So now you can linearly interpolate and basically capture all the expertise gained from all the expert models uh, and just merge them together linearly or with a weighted average. And Is this ultimately well. that like the parameters are capturing different things. It's like time for me to ask dumb questions about model merging. And it's like, we're just training these a little bit. So then like different parameters learn all of it and then merging it together, you just keep a bunch of it. Uh, that's right, yeah. I mean, sort of in the end, uh, I mean, all of that, there, there are these uh, sort of optimization directions and sort of a subspace. It's not directly mapped onto axes. So it's not like uh, you're optimizing in the, I don't know, a, a certain direction like math, and it's just this one direction or a set of directions. It's like, uh, because it's not axis aligns probably all the parameters, but all the parameters are sort of pushed in a certain geometric direction. And so um, you have the same for sort of another sort of concept. And then, um, yeah, if you push sort of both, then you can sort of merge them back together. Do and you think this has consequences on things that we don't measure for the model? Uh, <laughs> like, is this in making the model slightly more specific at, at all of these things? Like, it probably is. Like, there's no free lunch on stuff. Um, y- yes. Yeah, so, I think I think um, uh, probably if you over parameterize, um, 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 I think the biggest thing is if you optimize in multiple direction and there is competition, then uh, the the structure needs to be in a way where there's basically no slack. Like every parameter is used and the value, the correct value is important. And so what we see from quantization is the longer you train, the more data you use per parameter, the more difficult quantization gets. And so this is a similar thinking that 
if you yeah, really over <laughs> if you really overtrain your model, it will be more difficult to merge and, and preserve all the capabilities. So but, merging might work better at bigger models, assuming that we don't have that much more data. Uh, that's right. Yeah, if you train on less data per parameter, my expectation is merging works a little Do you better. Think knowledge distillation is similar. It's like merging became question. popular recently. Yeah. It seems like maybe yeah. it's like the one to hundred yeah. B range is the magic yeah. range where merging starts working. Is yeah. knowledge distillation happen to be similar? So, so I mean, for that. We probably need to talk a little about what these optimization landscapes. Yeah, mean. I don't really know what knowledge distillation. Like knowledge distillation yeah. is a reweighting of the log props in my brain, which is probably a simplification. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you think about normal neural network optimization, there's quite good literature that I actually really like um, that um, so basically uh, studies the dynamics of the Hessian. Uh, the spectrum of the Hessian over time. And so this is basically a study of the local curvature in the optimization space. So how quickly you change directions in the optimization space. Is Hessian is like a matrix second derivative, right? Yeah, okay. you can see Yeah, you can see it like Just that. Just making sure I remember yeah. my and fundamentals. And so the, the visualization that you can have is you're like um, going down a hill skiing and then you're going down a track, and then suddenly the track bends, and then it bends again. That's that's basically the curvature changing. Yeah. And you need to adjust the track to go down the hill, and so and not along the hill or something like that. And so, um, you basically study these changes in sort of curvature. And um, so what has been shown is that if you have a small data set, for example, in computer vision, you have like CIFAR 10, 10 classes, 10 labels. Uh, or you have CIFAR 100, 100 labels, then there are as many sort of primary directions as there are labels. So what you basically learn is uh, a lot of one, one, for feature, a <laughs> one feature for one uh, label. If, if you go to ImageNet, 1,000 classes, then it's no longer this one-to-one -one okay. mapping. Uh, that's also why the lottery ticket hypothesis breaks down. It's like, uh, from your initialization, it's not clear where these dimensions are and how to optimize them. So you have much more dimensions than 1,000, but not that much more. And for language models, it just explodes in sort of complexity. But this basically spans this optimization landscape. And how you can think about it is how it is evolving over time. And we also have some evidence for that is, for example, and just to give you an example, a visual example, it's like if you have a cat and a dog feature, these are pretty separate. But now if the model realizes, hey, they're different dog breeds, and hey, they're different cat breeds, then um, it's sort of a branching off a feature. So you have this tree of hierarchic features. If you want to learn a new one, you need to branch off. And that's mostly because if you have a random initialized neural network and you want to find an optimization path from basically the outputs to the inputs, um, it's almost impossible to learn um, a new connection through random weights. But it's very easy to expand, yeah, as, expand the path that you're already on, the feature that you're already on, with some um, sort of uh, slight modification of your existing feature. So the the dark label becomes. This like is two almost different like why the recurrent, or like what is the word for like that you have? You essentially in the model you have. This input goes around, and yeah. the input goes through yeah. the features, and it's like the going having the go around is nice because you have to learn like a delta on it, and you just add yeah. it rather than the whole thing. That's right. That's so right. like this is what if you listen. This is like chaining yes. podcasts, yeah. but like on the Dark Hatch podcast yes. with Anthropic or some other yeah. Anthropic media, they talk about this, which yeah. is like this is why it's yeah. like really nice for the models learning because it's just a simpler space. Yeah. There's a nice paper about this that studied this. Is um, I think it's called ResNets do. Um, Iterative refinement on features, uh, written by some colleagues. Um, I which really like. <laughs> and um, yeah, but so that is a natural way how features are learned. But it is entirely unclear what happens if you have a neural network that gives you sort of a distribution. So it's not like here's some pattern that you need to learn. It's like here's a distribution that you need to learn, and it's already very fine grained. So probably in this distribution, you already have the different dog breeds. And you get it from the beginning. So you don't need to learn the dog and then the dog breeds. You can learn all the dog breeds from the beginning. You can set up the optimization landscape so that you learn these features. And there might be a big benefit to learn a hierarchy, but there might also be a big benefit to set this hierarchy so up. So this from is the almost beginning. like knowledge distillation models are going to be different. They're different, different numerically in ways that we don't know yeah. how to explain. Yeah. And in our world, we see this as Gemma 2. Is not apples to apples with Llama three in terms of yeah. post training recipes. Yeah. It's like in our work, we're like, 
Gemma is a strong model, but yeah. we just don't know like how it maintains inform like how if MLU yeah. will drop more and all these yeah. things just yeah. because it's yeah. a different space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm um, I'm curious, like, um, um, if you can say a little bit more about about your experience there. Um, so, I mean, from my understanding, I haven't haven't worked very much with Gemma or use it, but what I see from the community, it has sort of very good benchmark numbers. But when people use it, then something feels off. Sometimes it works really well, but then there's some kind of gap that they're like, why can't it do that? Or I mostly think that it. I mostly hear similar things. That's yeah. like finicky to train. Yeah. And that has now self-fulfilled into where we select our models and like how we deprioritize it because we're just not confident in our model, our recipe translating. Yeah. And it's like, therefore it's a risk to be like, we yeah. launch with Gemma, but we don't actually, yeah. we're not as confident in how to explore there. That, that makes so sense. It's not, so it's, it's not, not substantial. Known, basically. Like it's yeah. just like a, I mean, this is something an academic could do. Like, yeah. What is the, like like what are the re what are the best practices yeah. between Gemma nine B and Llama eight B? Like like what are the differences? That's right. That's right. That's for example, good uh, good question to explore if you don't have much computer. Yeah, that's so right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the last one of these architecture or method series is recurrent like state space models. Yeah. I find state space models because the math brings me all the way back to my EE linear uh -huh. systems uh -huh. days. Uh -huh. But I don't know if that translates to how the neural nets actually learn because they have like the observability matrix and stuff yeah. in the math, yeah. which is nice. Like, do you see that that, is that like sub substantially more, is it just extremely different and we're just going to see? Um, uh, I, I don't think it's that much different from recurrent neural networks. Um, um, I think it's not about the computation, but about the learning patterns. Um, and uh, I am currently not super convinced. Um, I worked on architectures for like two years at Meta. Uh, all my projects failed because nothing really beat Transformers. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I see papers where people present ideas that I worked on, and I know, like, yeah, this will not work. <laughs> um, I didn't work on state space models. Yeah, so, yeah. But, and a colleague asked me, like, hey, you said, like, you don't believe in state paper models. Like, can you look at this plot and tell me, like, what, what, what doesn't look good here? And I look at this plot and I'm like, uh, I don't know. It's like, I have this feeling if I see this plot. And I looked at so many plots that yeah. these trends don't look good. And so, I can't point a finger to it, uh, but I think at a certain point it's just transformers will still be better, and that's what we're going to use. That's why my, my like um, all of branch all extend is like, oh yeah, ChatGPT will know to route to a state space model if it's a ten billion length document, and it'll be like point one percent of queries into <laughs> ChatGPT. It's like how many Google page queries do you have where you paste in a PDF? Like, not that many. So that's kind of like they. There will be a suite of models, and I like honestly, O one is like one of those niche things too. Yeah. So like, if I'm gonna say that state space models are small, like so is O one in that regard, yeah. and yeah. that's like what I'm like interested in doing in 2025. So it's like, yeah, I, I mean, maybe just to add to that, for for me, it's like I I've now used language model more and more and more, and what I see is it's just really important what information you provide, and long context models never work. Even the best ones, they are really bad in long context. And the solution is not take take your data, pass it through this long context thing. You need to pre-process your data and give the right data to the model. I think that's the right approach. Yeah. And from my experience, that yields much, much, much better results. And so I think that's what you well, want. Well, did you try Notebook LM? I tried it, yeah. It's almost like, the, it's like how to best interleave RAG with long context. Uh, I think, yeah, but there's this, um, so this is, for example, a system where you say like, hey, this is a product. Hey, people want this. I think they use multiple models and multiple model passes. Like they use yeah. Gemini, but they're doing weird things under the hood, yeah, which is why yeah. the open source replications yeah. are not going to cut it. Um, but I, I think this is exactly what the future will look like, complex systems. You will not have like all one where you like, here's my data, please solve things. It's like, no, that's not going to yeah. cut it. Um, you have like complex interweave things. And I think that actually makes open source more competitive because you can't launch complicated products. But it's like, well, this is the back to the beginning. It's like yeah. we have like LangChain and things in yeah. the open source. Yes. And everyone loves the shit on LangChain. But it's like, how do you evolve LangChain at all into tooling that can 
quickly yeah. spin off yeah. Notebook LM? Like, what is the yeah. what is the infrastructure yeah. where the config yes. file outputs Notebook LM? Yes, like that is just. I don't know if there are any software stacks that are open source that are that complicated. Maybe yes. Linux. Maybe an operating system is that complicated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I'm working on that. Um, so um, I will take some time. I'm not not started yet, but I'm designing the system basically. Um, but um, yeah, um, um, I think we are at an early stage. So that's a good advice um, for people too. It's like assume that it is early, and assume that your academic career is not a two year bus cycle that you need to race through. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I think a main problem also in that space, in sort of when it goes to complex system agents and so forth, is like. We haven't really defined the problems. Uh, when I talk to when I when I tell most people that hey I work on open source agents, they, 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 the first question they ask me is like, what are agents? What what what, what is unit yeah, definitions? Okay. It's like I relate. Um, <laughs> I don't. What is an agent to you? Um, um, I don't know. I had a definition, and uh, now I feel like it's less and less useful. Um, I think a definition that makes sense to me is sort of an agent is sort of a system of multiple steps that, that um, sort of um, makes a plan on its own, executes that plan. Um, I think that's how most people would define it. Um, if you have that de definition, that I would say I I'm not working on agents uh, because yeah. <laughs> I think that that's not what what the future will look like. I don't think that works. Um, it's much more like a system than an agent in some ways, where there's like yeah. rule following and you help can guide it to do be really good at a specific thing. Yeah, yeah. I think um, so. So you mentioned Langchain. There's also Langgraph. Langgraph people like it much more because you take the planning and execution away from sort of the agent. It's more like a pipeline where people can design more carefully, sort of engineer things. What is the difference? I don't like what is the what would be the core technical? Um, it's more fine grained control. So you can say like if certain evaluation has certain value, go along this branch. Uh, whereas an agent you would say like use my prompt and do what the answer says. And right. then it's like that makes no sense. Yeah, it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anything else you want to add? I think that it's like the most interesting thing is like you seem very bullish on open source winning. Oh yeah. And it's like it's good to have this optimism and it's how do we make this more of a reality? Because like I, we talked about Meta not releasing yeah. new models yeah. and it's like how do we make open source AI much yeah. more of a multi-stakeholder yeah. thing than just meta? Like, I yeah. think most people, like, we're weird people that are deep in the weeds of this. Yeah. Most people think it's just llama. Yeah. So, like, how do we bridge yeah. that gap? Yeah, yeah. I think um, if you have the mindset that it will be complex systems, it will not be a model receiving input, and if you have um, um, this is sort of thinking is like. You need something that's useful for people. You don't want O1 where it looks shiny and nice and it can do reasoning, but it's it's not super useful. Um, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't try to replicate O1. Um, you shouldn't try to like work it. on right. a good model. <laughs> um, you need more complex things. And so once you have this mindset and get away from like, yeah, I don't develop models and I don't and and focus is like I try to build something that's useful. Then you go in the notebook L sort of LM direction, yeah. which is easily doable open source. I think it's 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 a bit more complicated, and we need to piece things together. And we don't have the open source. It's software almost right like now. we need people to experiment. Mm -hmm. And when you obviously are onto something that can work, but has limitations that are just like rough edges, yeah. not fast enough. Yeah. It's like ignore all the things that obviously get better in the ARC technology. And it's like we need people that are experimenting and that can become collaborative through open experimentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So this um, is like that's like the summary of our conversation. It's like that, be more creative on your approach and therefore the benefits will come eventually. Yes, yes. I, I think I think that's uh, yeah, that's a good takeaway. That's fun. Okay, well thanks for sitting down and doing this. I don't I don't have more questions. I'll slowly get off and turn off the various microphones <laughs> that are going on. Uh, yeah. Um yeah thank thank you so much again for having me. Um, I mean, one thing that I could add, I could talk a little bit about GPUs and quantization. 
Do you want to? I'll let you. You can riff. This is good. <laughs> um, so, so one thing that people ask me, like, which GPU should I buy? And so I have here a certain perspective that might be helpful for people. Um, I think it's not fully validated yet, but sort of, I mean, you were mentioning hardware gets better and better. Yeah. I think we're close to the end. I think uh, the next generation of GPUs will more or less be the last generation of GPUs that we get. Um, uh, there's just challenge of improving things. Um, do you mean on peak flop, or are you also thinking on flop per watt? It's more like flop per watt, watt mm -hmm. and um, density yeah, it will not improve much. It's just more like, um, um, I think what will become more important is networking, data center, center level efficiency, but not necessarily GPU or device level efficiency. Uh, there are just a lot of physical problems. There's still a little room for sort of improvements, but uh, the computational patterns are pretty optimal. And um, if we look at the scaling behavior of quantization, which was basically the main thing that improved efficiency, you had tensor cores, and then you went from 32 to 16 bit. 8 bit didn't work quite out. With Blackwell, we can get 8 bit <laughs> yeah, working. Um, but then. Um, what about 4 bit? Like, does 4 and 2 real? Or are those just. Fake? I mean, research says, like, it will not happen. Well, it's necessarily 1 bit paper. Uh, well, I, that's the type of paper where I'm like, yeah. oh, have your fun, but it feels fake. <laughs> so, so I mean, the thing is, uh, a couple of papers point to this, and I know a couple more papers will come. The main thing is, if you train, as you train longer and longer, you have more data that you, you basically train on per parameter. This determines the bit precision that you need. One bit is good if you train a small model for not a long time, so or a large model like, for. There might be cases where those further quantization matter, but it'll be in lower data regimes. Um, or you have a bigger model, but at some point it becomes a trade-off. If you have a bigger model, you need more compute, and so if you have more compute in one bit or less compute in eight bits, does that mean like the sixteen to eight range is where the most of the optimum lie? Yeah, you can get six, maybe four. I mean, four for inference is pretty good. Um, yeah. But four for training, it will be quite questionable. And I mean, if our models just get more compute intensive, I think the bit precision will actually increase. I have six is already borderline. Um, I think eight would be definitely possible. With Blackwell, no problem at all. Um, so I think um, most training will be done in eight bit when we have Blackwell. Um, but yeah, I think we can't squeeze a quantization much more. Yeah, and I'm not going to push you at all on this. I just find it fascinating, yeah. and people find it fascinating. I was like, um, and the other thing to add is like, uh, Blackwell has will have particular hardware features for quantization that makes it much easier. It's, it's a comparable like we had FP16. But it was very difficult to use for training because you need to use mixed precision because you have like uh, problems with like um, um, your loss basically vanishing or exploding, and so not not being captured by the data type. And then we had switched to brain float sixteen. And suddenly people are like, oh, I can train without any problem because now it's you have the entire change. range. It's just a, yeah, it's a change of the range. Yes. And so Blackwell will have a similar change for quantization, so eight bit will be easy. Like you can get eight bit working. If you do it really why, well, why does this only happen on Blackwell and not the previous? Because generation? they have hardware support and okay. it's automatic. And so, um, yeah. So you could do it, but it would be very slow. Before. It would be slow and it would be hard. Yeah. So, I mean, if 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 I would work it on, on, on this sort of problem, I probably would need a couple of months to really figure it out. Um, a bit training is possible, but if you do it with software, it will be will not give you huge speed ups. And um, it's just difficult. And with Blackwell, it's like, oh yeah, I pick eight bit and everything's working. Uh, wait, have you used these? Uh, you, have you actually used these new GPUs? Or you just uh, you know, I know their technical specification, and then some sort of secrets okay, um, about sense. about. The, I mean, like I also can get like, like <laughs> once you are connected to the right people, you can like learn these things, and that's right up your alley. So yeah. that's interesting. That's right. I, yeah, I'm mostly like oh, quantization is a feature that I get to use, and I'm not in that area so i just take the benefits as they come it's like one of my things is like there will be weird benefits that regularly come and it's good to be fast adopting things yes. but like otherwise i just let people yes. do these yes. things yes. and it's great yes uh but I, I, as i mentioned sort of um in the beginning as like quantization is one of these factors we now have maxed out the factor 
pretty much. So we should look for other factors. Um, but it gets more and more difficult. Like we cranked up the multiplier on a lot of things and we quickly run out of multipliers. It's so interesting because you are one of the people that everyone recognizes for quantization in other compute research. But you're like, I've needed to, I'm starting my professor career and I'm going to be doing creative things because that's like where the future lies. <laughs> it's like yeah. models, like, like in some ways you're also de-risked because if model scaling works, you get the benefits anyways. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. But um, now, yeah, it's, um, I mean, I worked on quantization for such a long time, but it's time to move on. The, the problem is kind of solved and we need to move on to different problems. Yeah, really? that was great. Thanks for adding this on. Mm -hmm. Any other wisdom to drop? <laughs> I, I, no, I really enjoyed this conversation. It was yeah, great. it's fun. Thank it's you. good to just have a you just like have a forcing function to talk about stuff, and it'll be fun working together. I'm sure yeah, we'll cross yeah, paths no, next year. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to that.